Hello and welcome to the Figgy Art Museum's Virtual Thursdays at the Figgy series. My name is Melissa Moore and I'm Director of Education at the Figgy and I'm happy you could join us tonight. For the time being, we're hosting these virtual programs on most Thursdays, so please check out the Figgy's website for program topics and to register for free. We're able to offer these programs at no cost to you thanks to the generous sponsorship provided by Chris and Mary Rayburn. Chris and Mary, thank you so much. While these programs are free to watch, I encourage you to consider becoming a Figgy member. Your support as a member really does help us continue to fulfill our mission of bringing art and people together, even when we can't be together in person. So tonight for the program, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine Manthorn for a special program offered in conjunction with the exhibition For America, 200 Years of Painting from the National Academy of Design. Dr. Manthorn is Professor of Art History at the Graduate Center of City University of New York, where she specializes in modern art of the Americas. Prior to joining the faculty at the Graduate Center, she was Director of Research of the Research Center at Smithsonian Art, I'm sorry, she was Director of the Research Center at Smithsonian's American Art Museum. She has held numerous prestigious fellowships and worked on exhibitions and catalogs both at home and abroad. And while her scholarship has long focused on landscape and hemispheric dimensions of American art, recent research highlights the role of women within the visual culture of the Americas. Her 2020 publication, Film and Modern American Art, The Dialogue Between Cinema and Painting, includes a chapter on women of the silent era. And two additional new books also published just in 2020 continue that focus. Those publications are, Women in the Dark, American Female Photographers, 1850 to 1900, and Restless Enterprise, The Art and Life of Eliza Pratt Greatorex. And it is this last topic of artist Eliza Pratt Greatorex on which we'll be focusing this evening. So Dr. Manthorn, thank you so much for joining us for your presentation tonight of the enterprising Eliza Greatorex. Well, thank you, Melissa. This is really an exciting uh, evening for me. Uh, I want to thank you for all of your help and especially to uh, congratulate the Figgy Museum for bringing this exhibition uh, to, the, to your audience because uh, when I was a graduate student, I actually uh, took a seminar with Barbara Novak and we were uh, very fortunate to be able to do an exhibition called Next to Nature, which dove in and did a whole kind of analysis of the National Academy um, landscape collection. And then later I did an exhibition on James Sudam who gave a large portion of his collection uh, to, the, to the Academy. So it's a place that's very dear to my heart. And of course uh, has the portrait of Eliza Greatorex that is on the cover of my book that you see on the right hand corner of your screen now. So I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about this uh, this evening. And on the left of the screen, you'll see we'll, we'll talk about this in a bit, but this is um, the building that the Academy uh, called home in the 1860s after the Civil War. So uh, I think we'll just dive right in and talk a little bit about uh, this subject. So I did want to mention that 50 years ago, in 1971, the art historian Linda Nochlin posed this question, why have there been no great women artists? And when you think about it, we're now in March 2021, uh, at, towards the end of Women's History Month, and we're still pondering this. So as we, as we uh, talk tonight together and in the Q&A, we might think about this whole idea of the, first of all, how greatness is defined for artists and where the women fit into that. So this is the subject of our talk tonight. This is a portrait by Ferdinand Boyle of the artist Eliza Pratt Greatorex. So this was painted in 1869. And it's in the uh, exhibition that you can see at the Figgy. And I, I was very excited because I'm in New York, but I was still able to go online on the Figgy uh, website and they have a wonderful virtual tour of this uh, collection. So I, I definitely urge you if you haven't been able to visit in person or can't visit it in person, uh, do take advantage of that because you can really um, you know, zoom in and look at the images at your leisure and really enjoy it. But uh, so the, the, um, the sort of 
rule of the academy was that when a person was nominated or elected to, as an academician or an associate academician, uh, they had to uh, give the academy a painting. So at the at the associate level, which is where uh, what, what Eliza was elected to in 1869, you had to supply either a portrait or a self-portrait. So in this case, she wasn't really a figure painter, so she commissioned uh, Boyle to paint this portrait of her. And you can see at this point, she's 50 years old and uh, she's a very distinguished looking woman. So um, she was born 1819, died 1897. And certainly the best known and the most respected of the female artists in the United States in the 1860s and 70s. If someone asked you, you know, what artists you th can think of, female artists in America in the 19th century, I think most people might come up with Mary Cassatt as the most likely candidate, but she was a little bit later than Greater X. So in this period um, of the 60s and 70s uh, in New York, uh, she is really the one. So she came from Ireland to New York City when she was in her 20s and then met a man named Henry Greatorex. And he was a very fascinating figure himself. He was British. He was a composer and a musician. And from a very distinguished uh, family of musicians, his father was actually the organist for Westminster and was later buried in, uh, in the cathedral. So that was a great honor. But Henry was, I think, the fifth son, so unlikely really to inherit anything. He must have decided maybe he would try his luck in America. So he came to uh, the US. He lived in Connecticut for a while and then uh, on to New York. So he marries Eliza Pratt in 1849, and they have three children of their own. And he had one from a previous marriage. Sadly, his first wife had died in childbirth. But within 10 years, Henry himself passed away, leaving Eliza with four children and very little means of financial support. So just to go back in her life a little bit, um, she was born on Christmas Day, 1819 in Manor Hamilton. And I'm just showing you the map on the right of Ireland. Uh, she was in the north of Ireland uh, in this area, the country Latrim here. And her father on the left was a Methodist minister. So at that time in Ireland, the Methodists were very much itinerant preachers. They would move from place to place. So he, uh, just imagine each year they moved around this whole region in the north of Ireland uh, from one place to another. And uh, so Eliza grows up having a rather peripatetic uh, childhood, you might say, not necessarily calling one place home, but um, certainly grounded in her family and in uh, their cultural life. And this painting I wanted to show you because I think it's kind of wonderful. Uh, it's not a portrait of, of Reverend Pratt by any means, but it's an image of the itinerant minister in Ireland. So this just gives you a little bit of an idea of just how Reverend Pratt would have had to uh, operate. The, you know, they, as he traveled around from place to place in this very rural area of the north of Ireland in the 1820s, 1830s, you know, he wasn't stopping at nice churches. Uh, he oftentimes preached in someone's sitting room or parlor, or in this case, you can see maybe a barn or some other large space. And there are reports too that the Methodist ministers just stood on the back of a cart and talk to people. So this was rural Ireland. This, you can see the mix of people here. Some look a little bit more sophisticated than others, but this would have been the kind of um, congregation that her father had at the time. So just to mention, since we're talking about women in the National Academy, I just wanted to introduce you to a couple of the early figures who were uh, sort of pioneers. This is a woman named Anne Hall, and she was elected to the Academy in 1827. So that's only two years after the Academy was founded. So this is, you know, it starts out to be uh, a sort of a, a kind of group that wants to support the arts in America, which in the 1820s uh, was still kind of a fledgling operation. But over time, it expands to include uh, art classes, exhibitions, and other things. So it's a very important organization and grows to be the most important art organization in the uh, 19th century America, I would say. So this is a miniature by Ann Hall. So just keep in mind, it's only four by four inches. 
And you can see, you can uh, usually tell when an artist includes herself in a portrait because she's the one looking out at us. Uh, some people say it's because she had to actually look in the mirror to do her portrait. Um, other times, maybe she just wanted to make eye contact with the viewer. But you can see she's looking out at us and then her sister and her nephew are also in the composition. So at this early stage, first of all, these are small uh, miniature works. Uh, so this would have been considered, you know, a, a, a appropriate medium for a woman. And also it's often, it was often stereotyped at the time that a woman should paint, you know, children, flowers. So here you can see Anne Hall is uh, creating a wonderful miniature, but nonetheless keeping within the confines of the expectations for a female artist. This is just one more artist who was uh, elected before Eliza. She was elected in 1845, and these are two miniatures by her. So again, these are small. On the left, you can see it's just a locket, uh, four by three inches. And on the right, um, I'm just showing you the whole this whole piece here because this is the top and it would fold over. So you can imagine this is a case and you could kind of open it up and look at this little precious uh, image in, inside. In this case, it was actually uh, the, the, the great, the, sorry, the grandson of Paul Revere, the great patriot. So this was Mrs. Bogardus, who was um, in the Academy in 1845. And then uh, this is one of the works in the exhibition. So I did want to mention it to you, Cecilia Bow, who at the end of the century is uh, a very big a success as an artist. And so here she is in her self-portrait in 1894. So she was single woman from an old family but with a distinct uh, lack of fortune. So uh, different women had different profiles at the time. Uh, many of the women artists did tend to, um, in the late 19th century, did tend to stay single to focus more on their careers. So let's imagine then we're back in New York in the spring of 1869 at the National Academy of Design. And this is the building which is located at East 23rd Street, if you're familiar with the city, and, and 4th Avenue. So it was a very handsome building, uh, just re recently opened after the Civil War in 1865. And imagine that every spring there would be an exhibition of the works of the members and people, you know, would come to these exhibitions. It was it was a big social event, really. Um, you know, many people would gather here, and this uh, building, you know, would accommodate large crowds. And afterwards, there would be reviews of the artist's work and so on. So this was an important event every year. And here, I just wanted to show you. This is another work in the exhibition at the Figgy, and I think this is a wonderful. Uh, kind of image of this African American woman uh, named Jane Jackson, formerly a slave. So the artist Elhu Vedder would have been a contemporary of Eliza Greater X. And we know from his um, memoir that he said that this woman uh, was selling peanuts on the corner near his studio. He would see her every day, this woman, Jane Jackson. Um, and he became very interested in her demeanor and her appearance. And he began to talk to her and invited her to come to his studio and to model for him. So he did this painting of her and later um, this, this small scale picture and later it evolves into other works that he did. But I mention this because um, if we go back to the National Academy for a minute, um, we know that from reports at the time as people were entering um, the building and going into this rather, you know, she she event, down on the street would be peanut vendors, people selling apples. Um, so New York was always the city of contrasts, the very rich, the very poor, the artist, the street vendors. And uh, so this was the whole kind of fabric of the city in which um, Greater X found herself when she came from Ireland uh, to America. And I should mention also that when this work was exhibited, no less a person than Herman Melville uh, saw it uh, in the exhibition, and he actually wrote a poem about this, about her, um, just her appearance, and, and he found her very fascinating and mysterious. And she actually told uh, Vetter when she was sitting for him that, you know, she had come from the South, she had been a slave, she had come North, and that she had a son who was actually um, joined the, the Union Army and he was fighting in the Civil War. So it just gives you an, a bit of a, an idea of just the multi-layers of the city and the art world at the time. 
But, you know, just imagine now we've gone upstairs, um, we've climbed the stairs outside the building and encountered this very large gathering of art lovers. So when you think about it, um, you know, most of the artists who were exhibiting at the time were male. Greater X was almost the only uh, female member and uh, very few other women were even were exhibiting. So how did she negotiate this world? How did she, you know, socialize with people? How did she try to make a, ma a name for herself um, in the midst of all this? You can see that a lot of people are, you know, looking around, chatting with one another, not really paying attention to the artwork. And only this one poor woman in the middle here seems to be trying to look at the painting over foliage and other people. So it was, you know, a place to meet and greet, to see and be seen. And uh, Gregor X had to learn how to negotiate this. So imagine, again, there are different spaces in the exhibition. Uh, this was the upstairs area, the upstairs gallery, where you can see there were exhibited landscapes and smaller works. And just notice too, you know, everything was had to be negotiated. Where was your painting to be hung? You can see that the paintings go from floor to ceiling and those lower, of course, would be more easily viewed by the public. Those further up towards the ceiling, what the artist called being skied um, would be tougher to, to see. So what happened in the days before the exhibition? How did this whole thing get set up? Well, first of all, the Academy had a rule that you were supposed to exhibit a picture that had never been shown before. It was supposed to be something fresh, something new. So you would send it to the Academy and the jury would look at it and look at all the works that were submitted and decide which ones would be included and which ones they were sending back that were not going to be included. Then the hanging committee would uh, decide, okay, this one goes here, this one goes there, this one goes in the corner, this one goes up above. And then when everything was installed, the, the day before the exhibition, the artists would be allowed in and then they would scurry around to try to find you know, where their work had been placed. And you can see this poor man in the corner, I think he looks like Jervis McEntee, um, it might be um, identifiable, but you can see he doesn't look at all happy about where his painting has been located. And then other people, what are these people doing? I don't know if you, um, th this was called varnishing day. So what they would do is they would bring their varnishes and paints. And once they saw where their work was, was hung, then they could sort of add some varnish to make it shinier to sort of reflect the light. Or as you can see, this other man here um, in the lower left has his uh, palette and his paints, and he's actually adding some color. So, you know, you could add a little highlight of white or something that would uh, give it a little bit more pizzazz once you could assess the lighting conditions because, you know, there would be skylights and, and, and other things, but, it, you know, the, the, they would have to adjust the painting to uh, conform to the lighting. And here I'm just showing you I don't know if some of you have seen the movie uh, Turner about the British landscape painter, but this was a scene, this painting was the basis for a scene in that movie. Turner was really famous. He was, you know, a virtuoso and uh, he would show up at the Academy with a, you know, a painting that was barely half finished and just sort of, um, you know, do, do add some paint and, and create the whole thing on the wall at the Academy at the time, you know, showing off a bit, of course. And other people were very sort of um, looking on with envy and, and scorn and other things. So this was kind of an amazing um, process. And here on the right, um, uh, this is just, uh, again, to show you the range of artists who are uh, doing this kind of work. And you can see that in the case of the Royal Academy in London, which was in a way the model for the Royal Academy in New York, I mean, for the National Academy in New York, um, women were there. So you can see some of the women too, trying to adjust their, their paintings. So all that's going on and everything uh, is, is finally settled and the public is allowed in to see the work. So, of course, that was very important because uh, that was the way, you know, in New York in the 1850s and 60s, there weren't very many um, commercial art galleries. So the National Academy was one of the main ways that they were able to show their work to the public and actually sell their work. So it was, you know, it was an important event and a lot of artists, um, you know, really depended on that income to keep them going. So uh, Greater X was able to return to Ireland um, in the 50s and uh, did some sketches and things and including, this was her mother's homestead where her mother grew up um, in uh, called Tullylark. And so she does this painting 
which was exhibited at the National Academy in 1858. So, you know, she's already, she's kind of asserting her own identity as someone coming from Ireland. And you can see creating this, you know, kind of rustic uh, landscape that, uh, that she exhibits as part of her offerings to the Academy, which was luckily accepted. <laughs> So I wanted to uh, follow up on this theme of how do you see America? Uh, this idea of the uh, theme of the, of the exhibition or the title of the exhibition for America. Because here's Greater X as I'm trying to uh, present her as this person who grew up in Ireland and comes to New York when she's already in her twenties. So how does she see America? So one of the um, images that she does that I'm showing you here is, uh, this is a, a pen and ink drawing of, the, of Castle Garden and the Battery in 1875. So if you're familiar with um, New York City at all or with the history of immigration, you know that as people came from Europe um, in the 1850s and afterwards to uh, come to the New World, to come to America from usually from Europe or uh, well, that was the most common place, especially the Germans and the Irish in this period. Um, you would land at Castle Garden and you would, um, you know, be sort of processed through and, and uh, give it your name and, and allowed then to enter this uh, new country. So by including this as a subject that she does, Greater X is again emphasizing this idea that she, like many people, have come from somewhere else. She's she's an immigrant, and she um, you know is part of this melting pot. So a shared experience that she uh, basically presents to the public in a visual way. So this is another work in the exhibition that I really encourage you to look at closely because it's a wonderful painting by Asher B. Durand, who was the so-called dean of the Hudson River School. Thomas Cole, of course, was usually called the founder of the school, but when he passed away in 1848, the mantle of the Hudson River School really goes to Durant. So this painting is in the, in the academy of which he was also the president for many years. So he was a very important sort of, you know, art world uh, kind of ambassador, if you will. Um, so you can just notice, you know, beautiful pastoral landscape he was especially expert at painting trees and the light hitting the bark on the trees, which you can appreciate here. But I have the arrow going to two different motifs, uh, this here and in the back uh, on the far side of the water. And I wanted to show you blow ups of those two areas because again, it's t telling us more about um, his feelings about nature. But first just notice that, you know, he's celebrating the beauty of nature um, the, the harmony between man and nature, because this is what a greater X will also pick up on. So here you can see this is the detail of the figures. And if you, if you look closely, you can see there are two male figures. One is standing, uh, pointing with his walking stick. And under his arm, you notice he has uh, some kind of portfolio. And the other man who's perhaps gotten a little bit more weary, he's already put down his walking stick. And what you see there is that red um, sketchbook that he's put on the ground. So we can infer from this that these are two artists, but in a way it doesn't matter who they are. It just happens that, you know, that Duran probably was sort of including this as a, as a motif to reference artists. But the idea is that two people are communing with one another through nature. So it was this very, this moment when transcendentalism, when this idea of the uh, beauty of nature and almost nature worship was very much um, part of people's thinking. So that was one important element. And here you can see, this is the uh, detail of the far shore. And you can see those little white buildings that make up the town. And then the one form that actually breaks uh, above all the others is of course the ch church steeple. So again, you could just say, okay, well, Durand was, you know, just happened to notice a town over there, but over and over, he includes this motif in his work. So we know this has the symbolic meaning of God and nature. So this was very important uh, ideas in America at the time, this idea of, you know, looking at nature as evidence of God's handiwork and uh, the, the, also the blessing on America for giving this country, this wonderful, uh, beautiful open spaces that other, other places didn't have. So this is a, a, then a landscape by Greater X. And you can see, you know, she studied with Hart and some of the other people who um, 
were basically following the, the dictates of Duran. So this is, you know, they all have sort of unified ideas about nature, about America, about landscape. And here you can see that in her case, she's included some of the cows in a town over in the distance on the left or some buildings at least I should say. Um, so this idea again of the harmony between man and nature, it's a beautiful calm day. Uh, we can uh, basically enjoy the beneficence of the divine through this beautiful scenery. And many of them of her male contemporaries also began exploring further afield. They didn't just stay in the Hudson Valley or the New York area. Uh, they went to many different places. And so she too actually goes out to Colorado to the Rocky Mountains. And here I'm just showing two of her works um, that you know she and her two daughters went together and she actually is climbing. If you've been in the area of the um, Colorado Springs and uh, some of the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, you know that there are many of these 14,000 foot peaks in the area. So she's climbing them. Uh, they also, her some of her hosts uh, actually brought her to a mine and lowered her down into the mine to see the workings of, this, of the silver mine. So she's having all these kind of wilderness experiences and then recording them also in these pen and ink drawings, she's discovered that you know pen and ink gives her a more mobile uh, practice than uh, lugging her oil paintings around with her. So she's using the pen and ink drawings and also uh, recording all her observation observations on this trip. So she actually publishes them in this book called Summer Etchings in Colorado in 1873. So certainly one, a very pioneering effort on her part, uh, one of the first women from the East to go West. And these, I love this, these um, rock formations, these crazy rock formations in the so-called Garden of the Gods. Uh, and she is very fascinated by them as well. And she writes another article after she finishes the book. It seemed like she kept thinking about this place and talks about the geology, but also the fascination of, you, you can see they almost look like half human, uh, these gods that maybe also in her mind tied in with um, maybe Celtic mythology because they're again, sort of uh, let your imagination run wild when you see some of these forms. But then she comes back to New York and uh, she begins this, and this is really the other phase of her thinking about America and what America, how she thinks of it and what it means to her because she sees all this urban renewal going on after the civil war. You know, there's lots of money that's come into New York um, people want newer, bigger, fancier houses. There are now, you know, you, they want them with elevators. They want them with all kinds of, you know, modern amenities. So they begin to knock down all the old buildings. And here you can see in this painting, just all kinds of things going on, the scaffolding here, people building, the, all these men building the uh, foundation for a new building, another one over here. Uh, I'll just show you one detail. So you can see even better the scaffolding that's around this building. They're going to take it down. Um, it also at the time, of course, telegraph wires and even uh, street lights. So, you know, things are beginning to uh, change rapidly. And, she, and she's very uh, horrified by this because she comes from Ireland, a place that reveres the past and preserves their historic monuments. And she sees the New Yorkers just, you know, not really caring about their history, just knocking these buildings down, just always wanting something new, new, new. So she begins to think, okay, what can I do about this? And this is just one other artist's response to this. You can see this is called the so-called March of Improvement. And again, the building from 1776, the crew is dismantling it. Old, beautiful old trees are being knocked down and no one even cares. Everyone in the, in the, in the crowd is talking to one another. They don't seem to really uh, object at all to this loss. Only this one elderly man here you can see is sort of pointing, trying to get people's attention. So we can almost imagine that that's the way Gregorex felt about this as well. So what she starts to do is she gets news that a particular building is being uh, demolished. And so she goes to the site and she just makes drawings of them because she feels very strongly, you know, she knows that she's not gonna stop the, you know, this march of progress, so-called. Um, she's not gonna stop Boss Tweed and his men from, you know, expanding Broadway and, uh, you know, selling real estate off and destroying the old farmhouses. But she figures at least she can make records of these buildings and create some kind of document that will um, preserve 
at least the look of the of the city, the old city, and, and make some kind of almost memorial to them. And here I'm just showing the arrow. Uh, there are two uh, female figures and the blow up on the left of the screen is the artist and her sister who would um, go through the materials that the workmen uh, took up from the interior of the buildings, finding panels and other things that they would bring home. And later Eliza Greatorex would uh, paint uh, see, you know, scenes of the building on those different panels. So this is just a range um, of these soon to be destroyed places that she's um, recording. You can see at the bottom, there's an oil painting, uh, but, but mostly she uh, used pen and ink because it was more, much more mobile. She could just go there with her sketch pad and her pen and, and sit down in her, with her um, and, and make a record of these buildings. So th this was her endeavor for over eight years. She made over a hundred sketches of these buildings. So that just gives you a little bit of an idea of the of the rampant destruction that was going on in New York at the time. And this is just one more sample I wanted to show you because uh, here in the upper right, you can see her version of it. And in the lower left, uh, this was an image from a, a, a journal or a manual, I should say, called Valentine's Manual. Um, and you can see in the, in the Valentine's, the, uh, the telegraph poles, the, the light fixtures, the road has some kind of, you know, pavement, or it's at least a sort of clear road, whereas she shows it as much more uh, covered over with trees and much more rustic or, or rural. So Northern Manhattan was rural at the time still, um, but not quite as much as, as she shows it, obviously. So in a way, I, I argue that she's casting uh, these scenes into the past when those buildings were really at their, you know, sort of in their heyday. And she and her sister interview the families who live there. Um, they make records of um, the different buildings and, and the histories. And, uh, and eventually they put it together in this book called Old New York from the Battery to Bloomingdale. So this is the uh, title page here. And I'm showing you on the left, eventually uh, there were, she puts it together in this very large bo volume. So just imagine this book is 14 inches high by 10. So it's a, it's a good size book. It's not just a, a little, um, you know, a little lap size book, but it's a serious folio volume. So altogether, she puts the text and the images in, into this book and really this kind of labor of love to try to uh, record and keep and preserve for posterity what old New York was like. So then on the right, I'm showing you the image and the centennial in 1876. There was the big 100th anniversary of the uh, nationhood of America in, in Philadelphia. So Greater X helps organize the women to exhibit in the women's pavilion. They had their own pavilion. And then she has this whole alcove. So where I'm showing you the red arrow, that was a whole area where she had all her pen and ink drawings, the, the book in a case, paintings were being shown. So this is her big moment when she sort of puts this whole project together before the public. And um, of course, at the centennial, there was this um, look back to history at the same time that it was celebrating industry. So it was of the country. So it was a perfect moment for her to have this all ready and present to the public. And then I just wanted to mention that throughout all this, her sister was one of her uh, collaborators and helpers. And she also had two daughters, daughters who both became artists. And uh, so I'm showing you here, uh, Kathleen Honora Greater X at the top and the younger daughter, Eleanor, uh, below her. So you can see they're both uh, are surrounded by their artworks. And Kathleen also, if you notice uh, behind her, has the piano. So the idea that um, you know, they sort of inherited the musical talents of their father and the artistic talents of their mother. And they too became um, professional artists and supported themselves with their art and always um, traveled and worked with their mother. So all this really kind of dovetails um, too into the women's movement, because um, if you keep in mind the idea that 1848 was uh, the Seneca Falls was the sort of beginning of um, a serious effort on the part of the women to gain um, more recognition and vote and other things. And Greater X is friendly with a number of these women. So here on the right, I'm showing you, this is a small photograph of um, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Uh, Susan B. Anthony especially was a friend of Greater X's. And on the left, this is kind of a wonderful image 
by Prang. This is a lithograph. So this would have been, you know, printed in the hundreds and distributed. So these women are the kind of the rock stars of the women's movement. And so uh, what you can see the, their identities here, Lucretia Mott, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Mary Livermore, uh, Lydia Child, again, Susan B. Anthony, and Grace Greenwood. So these two are especially, Grace Greenwood and Susan B. Anthony are close friends of Greater X. And uh, so we know that when some of these women were you know, going around speaking at these different rallies and, and, and engagements, that a lot of times Greater X would actually be on the, on the stage, sitting there amongst the, um, you know, the platform party, so to speak, because these women um, wanted the successful professional women uh, to be part of their entourage and to, to demonstrate that in fact, women were making it in, the, in, the, um, in this man's world and that they could actually uh, look to people like Greater X as a kind of model because she, and she also was very uh, generous trying to uh, give younger women information about where they could study, how they can negotiate the art world. Uh, so not just her own daughters, but she also uh, helped many other students. So the other thing I wanted to talk to you about is just the whole idea of women's portraiture and, you know, especially women artists. How did they present themselves as artists? How did they sort of indicate um, something about their own identity and the fact that they were practicing artists? And so here are two of the uh, women who sort of flank Greater X. Uh, the one on the left, Lily Martin Spencer. Uh, this was a painting from 1840, that's a self-portrait. And so she's um, a younger woman, as you can see, and Mary Cassatt on the right uh, towards the beginning of her career. So in this case, we can't really tell what their profession is. Um, they're, they're, they're sort of moody, attractive women. Um, and stare, in, in the case of Spencer staring out at us, Mary Cassatt seems lost in thought, but we wouldn't necessarily know they were artists. Uh, so here we see great, come back to Greater X portrait. And I'm just comparing her here to uh, Elizabeth Vigie Lebrun, who was a French artist, very well known and successful in her day in the late, 19, late 18th uh, century and into the early 19th. And she was actually the uh, favorite portraitist of uh, Marie Antoinette. So she was very successful. She was one of the women who was actually nominated to the uh, French Academy. And here you can see her uh, not as severe as Greater X, a bit more feminine with this big red bow and uh, staring, looking out at the viewer. So in this case, she's, this is a self-portrait of her. She's, she's creating her own work. And here, I just wanna show you these details because in this case, Vigie Lebrun definitely wants to identify as a painter. You can see she's uh, working on a painting in front of her and she's holding her palette and her paintbrushes. Greater X, on the other hand, is holding a quill pen and she has her hand on a book. You know, perhaps it has some of her drawings uh, stuffed into it, but it's definitely, you know, some kind of a book here, not uh, an easel or an oil painting. So she's uh, thinking a little differently about how she wants to present herself. And here I'm just comparing it. This might look a little on the, on the wacky side, but um, Nicholas Poussin was a 17th century artist that she certainly would have been aware of. And he was someone who, who again, didn't totally identify just as an artist, but he's presenting himself as an artist scholar. Uh, and you can see he has on the his hand on the book there. And one of his paintings is much further um, in the background behind him. So I think Greater X is looking at a number of these different images and thinking about and, and aware of them and thinking about how she wants to present herself as a 50 year old woman who has been just elected to the National Academy of Design. And one other source of inspiration might have been some of the photographs of the um, suffragettes and the women uh, in the women's movement. And I'm just showing you here, Susan B. Anthony again at her desk, uh, looking quite serious and pr proper in um, again, a high color and uh, dark colored uh, ensemble. So Greater X wants us to take her then as, as an artist, but she's moved from working in oil paintings to working with a quill pen. Uh, she does pen and ink drawings, but then that's also the instrument of writing and the mark of an intelligent woman, right? She's, edu you know, she's emphasizing this idea of education and um, her own uh, intelligence. 
And finally, just to think about this idea again of um, youth versus age and just how that was regarded in the 19th century. This is a, another wonderful painting by Lily Martin Spencer, We Both Must Fade uh, from 1869. So the same year as Eliza's portrait. And you can see that this woman here is, is um, holding a flower. So the idea, and then there is also a vase of flowers on the table. So this idea that, you know, fading, the flowers will, the petals will drop off. And uh, this woman's beauty is also fading. So even though her jewels and her dress might retain their same appearance, um, she is beginning to, uh, you know, fade in terms of her own youth. So at the time, people, again, we don't, we don't necessarily think of this in the 19th century, but there was already a kind of um, cult of youth. And um, this idea that, um, e you know, even when Susan B. Anthony actually announced uh, she had a birthday party, it was her 50th birthday, and the press actually said, well, this is one of the bravest things that um, this woman has ever done, actually telling us that, this, that she's 50 years old, because, you know, women were, would, you know, be very coy about revealing their age because it was, again, um, a sort of mark against them in a way. So how they presented themselves and how they uh, even thought of themselves in this uh, in a professional capacity is kind of fascinating. Well, then talking about that, we're jumping to Greater X about 1889. So she's about 70 years old. And here she is in her Paris, in a studio in Paris. And she's actually, we're seeing her at her etching table. And I don't know if you can see too well, but there's a little um, plate in front of her. So at the time she was still going outside and instead of drawing with her with her pen and ink, she was actually doing plein air etching. So she would take the small plate, the small copper plate and, and create the basic forms uh, out in the field and then bring them back to the studio uh, to, you know, to make them, to, to sort of put in the final details. So uh, st still at this age, she's still doing this. And these are just two examples of that. Um, the pond at Cerne Leville on the left and uh, Florence in 1886 in the right. So these, these works would have been small scale works, but quite wonderful in their, um, in their, as you can see, evocation of these places. And here I'm just comparing it to um, a painting by this man, uh, Stacy Tolman, just to make it a little bit clearer, you can see that they would use the screen to sort of reflect and direct the light because this was very close work. You'd be working on a plate um, with a needle and, um, and, and, and you know, the lighting was not always the greatest. You can see that Stacy Tolman has the um, skylight overhead, Greater X has the window, uh, but this was close work that was challenging. But she continues to do this until very late in her life. She, she's constantly evolving. Uh, she started out as a painter, then she does the uh, pen and ink drawings and the Book of Old New York. And then she goes on to have another whole career as a plein air etcher. So constantly evolving and a really almost like a conceptual artist, continually rethinking what she's doing and uh, creating this wonderful body of work that she left for us. So to follow her further adventures, I hope you do uh, look in my new book, Restless Enterprise, because there I try to actually interweave her with a lot of other women who uh, were working and, and practicing art at the time. And this is just a little doodle. This is her signature and a little doodler herself sort of running along. So I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Manthorn. We really appreciate you sharing with our audience members this evening in celebration of the exhibition for America. That was wonderful. Um, we do have a question that came in, and, and for those of you who may be thinking about your questions but haven't entered them yet, you can put those into the Q&A or into the chat, and we'll, we'll try to get to them. And of course, if, if the question comes to you in the middle of the night and you just need to know the answer, you can email me. I'm the one who sent you the link for the program this evening, and I'll make sure that we get that to Dr. Manthorn. So Dr. Manthorn, the first question do you think that Eliza Greatorex knew Samuel F. B. Morse? This was a question that was asked around the time that you were talking about the pen and ink or the, um, the ink drawings for Old New York for that publication and the prevalence of the, um, the telegraph poles. Oh yeah, well, she certainly would have been aware of, of his, his reputation, but um, 
how should I, well, well, Moore started out, he desperately wanted to be an, an artist, a painter, right? And so he, um, he created portraits, he, he desperately wanted to do history paintings. Um, he was one of the founding mem uh, organizers of the National Academy. He gave lectures about the fine arts. So he was a, a real, um, you know, dynamo and uh, foundational figure in the formation of the Academy. But then he goes on also to do a lot of important work in photography. We know that um, he was in Paris in, in uh, in the 1840s when uh, some of the, some of the new uh, I'm sorry 1839 when some of the new um, developments were really coming to the fore in photography and he reports those back to the American press and then he comes to New York and he he works as a um, is, is also doing work in photography and works with uh, you know other people who are in the forefront of, of developing this new medium but by the time greater X comes along and comes to to America um, he, he, Morse was no longer really active, so active as an as a visual artist. So I'm not sure if she would have actually met him or she just would have been aware of him. But certainly people were, um, you know, in awe of his scientific reputation and um, the work he did on the telegraph and other things. So he definitely would have um, been someone that people, you know, had on their minds in terms of the modernization of the city and some of the different uh, changes that were going on. Also, I should add that because she did go um, back and forth between the US and Europe, she goes to North Africa, she goes out to um, the West, she would have, of course, probably taken advantage from time to time of actually using the telegraph, <laughs> selling, sending telegrams. So um, that was another aspect probably of, you know, of modern life that we don't always think of, but she, she would have been doing that. So that's an excellent point. And thank you for exploring that question with us. Just a, a plug here, we do have a program coming up next week where Margie Kane, who is co-director of the Carpellis um, Library Museum over in Rock Island, will be speaking about Samuel F.B. Morris as inventor. So if you would like to learn more on that topic, tune in next week. We do have another question for you. Uh, so what was Greater X's connection to Ferdinand Boyle? Why did she choose him to paint her portrait? Any thoughts as to why she didn't choose a fellow female artist to paint the portrait? Yeah, I do. I do talk about that in the book, why she didn't choose a female artist. I mean, one of the possibilities would have been um, Lily Martin Spencer. But uh, Lily Martin Spencer was um, it, was not exclusively a portraitist. She also did a lot of genre scenes and other kind of work. And if you remember the work that I showed soon, uh, we both must fade the, the woman in the blue dress with the flower um, that was done in 1869. Uh, that was a large scale work, a full uh, full length figure. And I can only imagine that Spencer was very busy uh, working on that. And Greater X was had the responsibility to get a painting uh, done of herself in 1869. So uh, Spencer might not have been even available. If, if, if I have, I have no evidence that she actually tried to to um, talk to Spencer about this, but or engage her in any way. But um, you know, I speculated that in fact that she might not have been available had Greater X wanted her. Uh, but throughout uh, all her career, the whole career, once she came to the United States, Greater once Greater X came to the United States, she did tend to um, gravitate towards people from the British Isles. Uh, especially Scotland and Ireland. So for example, her teacher, uh, William Hart, uh, their family was from Scotland. And uh, then Boyle, of course, the name is, you know, it was he was he too was from um, from Ireland and the British Isles. So I think she felt comfortable with with these people, you know, that, that she had a certain um, background in common with them. And, um, but Boyle, even though today, he, uh, you, it, it might not be a name that immediately, you know, comes to mind or that you even know anything about uh, him, but in, in his own day, he was actually, uh, you know, a sought after portraitist. And he did a number of images of um, some of the generals of the Civil War, for example, and other statesmen. Another obvious you know, candidate, a man named Daniel Huntington, uh, who was another person who was the head of the National Academy for a long time. Um, he did, you know, I don't know, probably 500 portraits. I, I'm just guessing, I've never counted them, but he did an enormous number of portraits of well-known people in this period, including many of the 
artists in the academy. So, you know, but again, I think Greater X wanted to have someone that she felt more comfortable with and, and maybe even to give him some business, you know. So that, that's how that evolved as far as I know. Oh, well, thank you for talking us through that. Another question was come in asking if you could speak about Eliza Greatorex's death. Her death? That is correct. Uh, hmm. mm, well, uh, I, I, we don't know a whole lot about the last few years of her life. Um, the obituaries all say that she um, was ill for uh, for a few years. And, you know, a, a lot of times, even if they do give a cause in the 19th century literature, it's not really um, necessarily a, a, a direct one-to-one -one relationship to what we think of as um, a certain cause, disease cause today. So, but, but in, in this case, we, it doesn't, it didn't really specify. So we know that she had, um, an, she had, a, she was living in an apartment in Paris and um, her daughters at that time were living in a little town, not uh, not too far out of side of Paris, in um, the forest of Fontainebleau, um, or near Barbizon. And um, so, after she passed away in Paris, we know that her daughters um, had her uh, remains brought to Moray and buried in Moray, where you can still see her grave uh, today. Uh, flanked by her two daughters. And also, um, if the name Moray, uh, Moray so long, is familiar to anybody, uh, an artist named um, Sisley, Alfred Sisley, uh, was one of the well-known residents who lived there. He was an Impressionist who came actually from Britain. And so it, the, the daughters, the greater ex-daughters, especially Kathleen, was very friendly with Sisley, and um, who during his own lifetime was not at all financially successful. So Kathleen, you know, helped him when he was sick, he was dying of th throat cancer and um, Kathleen helped him. And I guess he must've given her or, or uh, some of his work. And then later when he passed away, um, I guess no other family um, came to claim him or took care of his, his remains. And the, the uh, greater ex sister is actually buried Sicily in the family plot um, with with the with their mother, so uh, next to her mother. So when you go there, if you go there, uh, you would see the the you know the four of them in a, in this rather small space, uh, headstones of the four of them with with Eliza Greater X in in the middle. But ex exactly what the cause of death was, I don't know. <laughs> well, thank you for going through that, and it's such an interesting thing for those who do plan to go there. Uh, something to look for. An insider. It's, I should say it's a really wonderful little town. I mean, you really do feel like you're stepping back in, in time and in history. And, um, you know, uh, you can imagine that these women who were concerned with, um, you know, preserving the past would have especially found this place, you know, very congenial because you do, you know, this sort of medieval uh, tower and uh, the old, old arches. It's, you know, it's really quite wonderful. Thank you. And then we do have another question that came in here. Did Greater X support herself as an artist after the death of her husband? Well, she certainly tried. <laughs> um, I, I, this is, you know, this is a tricky question because, you know, sometimes not, not all the financial records of any of, uh, of, of any of these people are really um, necessarily available. But we know that. Um, like many artists today, uh, she taught classes, art classes. You know, many artists today support themselves that way, and that's what she did. She had, um, you know, private art classes that she gave in the New York studio. And when her daughters uh, were old enough to to also be involved in that, they too took on pupils. So we know that they had, um, you know, students paying some fee to take classes with them. Uh, we know that they uh, did manage to sell paintings, and uh, she sold her books and her prints. Her daughters also, you know, pitched in. Kathleen was more, you know, doing artwork, but Eleanor was very flexible. She would illustrate other people's works. She would write articles for magazines. You know, all these things would bring in some income. But, and so we know that, you know, they were struggling. And at various points, uh, Eliza Greatorex even says, um, you know, we moved to, to we, we decided to leave for Europe because it was less expensive to live in Europe than it was to live in New York at the time. And, you know, even though it sounds like they led, led a kind of um, death setter life, you know, they went to Paris, they went to Colorado, um, they, you know, all the time they were traveling kind of modestly. And even when they 
they took the transcontinental railroad out to Colorado, for example, and we know from their accounts that they didn't even get, you know, a sleeper car. Um, you know, the, the daughters are, uh, are, are describing their experiences and saying that they're, they, they had to sleep sitting up in, in, you know, in the main, in the main cars where people were just, um, you know, upright all, all night and how difficult that was to go for several days across the country that way. So we know that they were never extravagant. Um, they talk about their meals, they would be eating, you know, fruit and a piece of cheese or something. They weren't, you know, eating out in lavish cafes or, or anything of that sort. So I think I, they always live modestly. They tried to get by. And I can only imagine that at various times, you know, other family members must have also, you know, helped them or, 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 or tried to, um, you know, give them a helping hand from time to time as well. All of those details really help us paint a picture, so to speak, of Eliza Pratt Greater X. So thank you for sharing those. And I, I do hope that everyone who hasn't already read your newest publication checks that out. We're going to wrap up with one more question here. It's actually a comment and then a subsequent question. Uh, thank you for this presentation. You mentioned that many of us probably think of Mary Cassatt when we think of women artists in the 19th century. And Greater X is, less, is a less familiar name for many of us. Why is it that Cassatt gained such mainstream recognition while other women have been left out of the history book? Greater X was obviously well known in her time. What happened? <laughs> yes, what indeed. <laughs> well, I think one of the one of the things that really happened is that um, when when subsequent historians came along, especially in the 20th century, and uh, sort of tried to put the history of art into some kind of logical um, comp and comprehensive. Uh, sort of progression, uh, they tended to think about this idea of, okay, you had the Barbizon school, then you had Impressionism, and then post-Impressionism, you know, all the isms that any of us who ever started, studied art history uh, earlier on uh, learned. And of course, you know, the emphasis too was on France as being, you know, one of the main centers. We're always taught that, you know, the America, what was going on in the U.S. Was, was inferior, that, you know, people in, uh, in France were much more modern, much more progressive. And so I think somebody like Cassatt later um, appeared to these um, historians trying to put this, rec you know, this sort of um, development the progression together. She appeared as a, you know, as a very good sort of stepping stone in the, in the midst of all this. I mean, not to take away for, from her achievement, she, she achieved a great deal. I mean, she is the only, um, you know, American to exhibit with the Impressionists. She was one of the a few women to really be involved in that whole scene. And she continued to have a very um, active career. She was also very influential in helping to shape the collection of the Havemeyers. Um, Louisine Havemeyer um, was married to a man named um, Harry ha ha Havemeyer. And if you've ever been to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, you know that their collection is really um, one of the sort of backbones of their of their 19th century art collection. So um, that I think too gave Cassatt um, a special sort of aura, you know, that she was involved with these movers and shakers, these these very wealthy people who gave their collections. She was involved, you know, she knew Degas and, and the artists in Paris. And so therefore she kind of moved into the story and a lot of these other artists who were, um, you know, trying different things, not necessarily uh, just leading towards these, uh, these ideas of, of modernism as, we th as, as it was thought of, you know, they tended to get left out. But don't forget, I mean, sometimes we think, oh, it's because she was a woman or something of that sort. But in fact, you know, people like Frederick Church, I mean, Church in the 1850s was, you know, he was a rock star. He was a blockbuster artist. I mean, he sold paintings for $10,000 and um, exhibited them uh, in, in single picture exhibitions that traveled around to 10 cities in the US and, and went to Britain. By uh, 1880, he was, you know, alive and well in the Hudson Valley and uh, no one knew his name at all. When he died in 1900, there was even a comment in the newspaper that said, oh, we thought he had died 20 years ago. You know, so, so it, it was a certain style of painting. It was a certain um, approach that these artists had that just didn't fit into the story of modernism that people were later trying to tell. So I think that's part of it. And now today, I mean, it's, it's really kind of exciting because 
so many more of the women are being, um, you know, their stories are being told, people of color. Um, there's just such a richness and a revision of the, our whole understanding of this moment that, you know, I think now it wouldn't be so easy to write these people out of history again. We have to recognize that, you know, that the art scene was very different than, you know, what, what we thought of maybe 20 years ago. I mean, it's, I think it's really kind of wonderful to realize how multifaceted and how many interesting characters there were exhibiting and selling their work and interacting together. And, and it just being, it's, I think it's very inspiring. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. It is inspiring and the same is true for your presentation tonight. Thank you so much for helping us celebrate for America. We're thrilled to have you as part of the programming for this exhibition. And I wish you so much you had been able to come here in person, but I'm glad you've been exploring our microsite online and enjoying that. Um, I wanna also thank our audience members for joining us this evening. You know, these programs are offered to help us gain more insight into the exhibitions and, and we're really thrilled that you could join us. I know you're all excited to see the exhibition for America in person. Just a reminder, it is on view at the Figgy through May 16th. And for those of you who do plan to visit the museum, please remember to check out our website for up-to-date information on our current policies and procedures. For those of you who wanna check out that microsite, please go to the Figgy's website and select the art tab, pretty easy to remember. And then under art, you go to virtual exhibitions and you'll be able to find that there. It's pretty cool. It's almost as good as being in the galleries and seeing the art in person, almost, but not quite. But we hope you do enjoy that. We also hope you'll join us for upcoming virtual programs, which are also listed on our website. As I mentioned, next week, we'll be hearing from Margie Kane, who's the co-director of the Carpellis Manuscript Library Museum in Rock Island. And she's going to further explore the life um, and work of the artist and inventor, Samuel F. B. Morris. This program is also offered in conjunction with the exhibition For America. We're kind of For America all the time these days, and we hope you enjoy the programming series. Like tonight, with next week's program, we'll offer it for free to the public, but we do ask that you register on the Figgy's website, and in that way, you'll get the link just a couple hours before the so again, thank you, Dr. Manthorn. Thank you to our audience members. Thank you all for joining us this evening. We look forward to seeing you at future programs and maybe even in the museum. And Dr. Manthorn, we hope you have a chance to visit us here in the Quad Cities when, when the right time comes. Thank you so much. Good night. Happy spring. <laughs> Happy spring. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.